Matthew chapter number 5, begin reading in verse number 27. <clears throat> Ye have heard that it was said of them by of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if that right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is profitable, profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes the third to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. I'll let you all know right now, we're not talking about divorce. So, take a sigh of relief. If you want to learn about divorce, go listen to the Sermon on the Mountain series that we did a few years ago, Brother Randy. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. So everybody just relax. Okay, it's already 900 degrees in here. Which means by the time church gets started, it's going to be 950 degrees in here. And everybody's going to be uncomfortable. Okay. But in these verses, Jesus is dealing with very unpopular topic. Okay, certainly. Uh, the very infrequently discussed topic because nobody wants to bring it up no more okay and uh, most importantly he's dealing with a subject that most people don't want to confront because they know that in their hearts which is where Jesus is dealing with in these passages they might be guilty of it okay nobody likes talking about sexual sin nobody likes hearing nobody likes thinking about what's going on out yonder okay and all the perversion out there okay but Bear with me for a few minutes, and then we'll actually get to the thought. Okay, we know, okay, those of us that were raised around church or those of us that have studied our Bible, okay, within the first ten commandments that God gave, what was one of them? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, that's what he says in verse number 27. Thou hast heard of old time. It was the, one of the first ones that they ever heard. Okay, thou shalt not commit adultery. That seems pretty cut and dry. Right, Brother Mike? Thou shalt not. Right? I mean, don't do. Okay, can't mess that one up. Right? Pretty pretty simple. Okay, well, if you want to argue about what adultery means, let's just look at what Jesus says. Okay? Verse number 28. He says, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's saying, It's not the act that makes you guilty, it's the desire to do it. Right, you do understand that before Adam or Eve ever ate of the fruit, the thought was birthed in their heart. Then they thought on it for a while, and then they decided to do it. Now, how long after was it that you know the servant or the serpent started talking to Eve before she finally? I don't know. Might have been a while. Might not have been a while. All I know is is that she had the thought, is put in her head, right? But she thought on the thought until she decided to do it okay now if God would have pulled the tree up out the ground okay and said hey I saw what you was getting ready to do does it make her any less guilty of actually eating the fruit if she was on her way had her hand outstretched to take the fruit but it was the intent she decided she was going to disobey God but the end of the act was just the fruition of what she had already decided to do in her heart. Okay? Let's look at it this way. If you get pulled over, because like Jordan, every now and then you've got a lead foot, okay? I make the argument, it's just because my legs, but Peter's probably got the same issue, right? In order for us to get foot onto gas pedal, either seat has to be in the trunk, right? Or in order to reach the steering wheel we've got to be a little bit closer and that means that our leg it, it, we just got to every now and then we just get too much leg on the gas pedal okay didn't mean to do it okay but whether or not I meant to let's say I did mean to do it for sake of argument but Bob 
like on the way to church this morning when I was doing about 70 on Pleasant Valley when it opens up into two, two lanes, right? It was, it's fine. Miss Little, there was nobody in front of me. But if I got pulled over, hey, I didn't hurt anybody. Doesn't matter. You decided to go too fast. It doesn't matter if you meant to lose control and then wreck and then end up killing somebody. You chose to do something that you knew was unsafe. Well, you say, well, I didn't think that it was unsafe. Well, that's a different point. The law is the law. Right? Well, Jesus said, if you've decided to do it, you've committed the sin in your heart already. Doesn't matter if you actually did it. Okay, well, you said, well, that just, that just applies to adults. Well, does it? That doesn't mean God is God, right? With God, all things are equal. Sin is sin, and sin is, you know, holiness is not sin. That's his two judgments. There is no gray area. He says, just because you didn't get to finish the work that was birthed in your heart, if you decide to do it, doesn't mean that you're not guilty of it. If you decide that you're going to lie to the boss in the morning, in God's eyes, you've already lied to your boss. Right? If you decide that you're not going to come to church on Wednesday night before Sunday's over, you're already guilty of forsaking the assembling of yourself like sitting in church on Sunday. You're going to pretend that you're right with God knowing that you're not going to be back the next time that the doors are open? Man looks on the outward, God looks on the heart. Right? You decide that you're not going to give a tithe even though you make, if you don't give what God said, the Bible says you're cursed with a curse. Right? Don't try robbing God. It's not going to end too well for you. But let's say you decide you're going to give 9.99999% just because you're obstinate and you don't want to give the tenth, but then God said give an offering on top of your tithe. So even if you give 10%, doesn't mean that you're completely right with God. Right? But if you decide I'm not going to give what God said to give, I don't care what the dollar amount was on what put into the offer plate. God sees it as a percentage, not a dollar amount. If you give less than what God said to give, right? we don't take up offerings around here until the end of church. Some places they do it before the preaching. It's always felt weird to me. It kind of throws off the, the flow of the service. But let's say the offer plate doesn't come around to the end like us. Knowing that the check you've got in your pocket isn't what God said to give, you think you're going to be able to worship in spirit and in truth that day? You already, you already wrote out the check. You already got the amount of cash that you, pur you purposed to put in the offer plate in your pocket. You say, well, I'll do it next day. Well, God knows your heart. I don't know your heart. I don't know the thoughts that are going through your mind right now. All I know is that God says if you purpose to do, you've decided to do it in your heart, you're guilty of it whether you commit it or not. If you purpose it, if you had the chance, you'd kill somebody, guess what? In God's eyes, you've already killed them. Doesn't matter that you'll never get around to doing it because you're afraid of the law and everything else. You're guilty of the act of murder in your heart because you said, I would do it if I could. Right, well, let's continue. Yeah, Jesus says that if you eye offend, pluck it out. If your hand offend, cut it off. Right, it's better to enter in maimed or halt or lame into heaven. That right, may be hindered down here, but making it to where God wants you to be <clears throat> than it would be to be unhindered here, but cast into hellfire. Right, well, it goes on to say, verse number 31. It has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now we can go back. We don't have time. Go listen to the Sermon on the Mount message that we talked. But God gave a bill of divorcement to Moses for the people of Israel because that's what Israel desired. Right? God made a way to do it, but God said there's a way to do it right and then there's a way to do it wrong. He goes on to say here, any man divorces, and then in this passage we get the very literal interpretation right, you can't mess this up it says you divorce granted God take a step back brother Ron 
who was the book of Matthew written to? The Jews. What did the Jews understand? The law. Okay? They knew what divorcement was, and they knew when it was right and when it was wrong already. But in this time, they were saying, well, if God gave us a bill of divorce, we can, we can use it whenever we want to. No, God gave it to you for a specific reason, to the Israelites. What was that example? Put away a woman for the act of fornication. He said, look, verse number 32, but I say unto you, whosoever put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. He says, y'all made a promise before God right, that you'd be one flesh. That you'd leave both your homes, you'd come together and you'd be one. And he said, and God says that unless the sin of fornication is the cause of the divorcement, that if those two go their separate ways, they're both guilty of adultery. Why? Because they left the marriage that they promised that they'd be a part of. He said, it doesn't matter if she goes off and she has a legal, right, according to their customs, marriage, because there's a legal document that said they got divorced. There's a legal document that says she got remarried. In the eyes of God, the first marriage never should have been voided because nothing happened that justified the marriage being dissolved. Now, in the New Testament, we get a few more qualif qualifications. The Bible says that if someone that was lost gets saved, and it says that their husband or wife was lost with them. The Bible says that if the spouse doesn't want to get in and get saved with the one that got born again, the Bible says, let them be divorced. That's right? going to be too much of a hindrance on the one that got saved. Right, but also, being in a marriage, they being one, how often have you heard our pastor say that far too often it's not the one that gets saved that pulls the other one into church, it's the one that's lost that pulls the saved one out of church. You think he just made that up on his own? No, that's what God knew. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote that that's one of the reasons you can do it. Right now he says, after the voice... Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. In order to be a Pharisee, you had to be married. Right? We know that all men forsook the Apostle Paul, but God stood with him. You know what all men means? His wife left him. She asked him for a bill of divorcement. He had to write it out. Because the Bible says here, chapter number 5, God gave unto the man the bill of divorcement woman couldn't divorce the man. The man had to give her a bill that says, I divorce this woman. Then the judges had to sign off on it. She came and said, I don't want to be married to you anymore. Well, after the Apostle Paul writes that there's biblical reasons to be divorced, he also says that he wished that all men were like him. You know what that means? He never got remarried. He says, if some can't bear it, let them marry, lest they burn in their flesh. Right? That their lust burn within them. He says, it's good for some people to be married. He says, but I would, right? inspired by the Holy Ghost to write it down in your Bible, he says, but I would that all men be like as me. What's that? Not to tempt your flesh to commit an act of adultery. Not to enter into relationships flippantly. As far as we know, the Apostle Paul lived the rest of his life single. Why? Because in his eyes, he promised that he was going to love one until the end. Now he's saying if, well, if somebody doesn't do that, they're wrong with God. No, the Apostle Paul said, let them marry. I'm just saying that everything going on here, it's because man got in the way of what God intended. All these conditions, all these exceptions that God had to make, you know why that happened? Because back in the beginning, God made man and woman. They was one. Right? One heart, one spirit. I mean, one flesh, one heart, one spirit. It's in complete unity. That's the way God intended it to be. God made the home before he made the church. God knew what a family was because he made it. Right? Well, what's supposed to be the thing after that well long before there ever was an I do or all the customs that we know nowadays people was given in marriage 
Right? What was the intent behind that? That they become one. But God saying all the customs, all the things that you've justified to say, well, this is how we can get divorced. This is why divorce is okay. Sometimes it is okay. That's not what Brother George is saying. Point is, he's saying it doesn't matter what's on paper. What matters is what's in your heart. He's saying those men that divorced their wives just because they thought they could get the new model down at the dealership, right, traded in for something that looked better, right? He says not only are they guilty of adultery, they caused their ex-wife to commit adultery because they caused them to enter into a new relationship. He's saying two wrongs don't make a right. But keep in mind, this is Bible times. Very rare that woman could go out have a job and provide for herself he's saying if you divorce your wife you're forcing her to commit adultery because she's got to get married to survive she can't hold her own job she can't open her own business she can't conduct business down at the courthouse because you had to be a man to conduct business down at the courthouse you say is that right brother Jordan don't get, don't get me started okay but that's how it was back then Okay, so, what's he say? You're not giving her another option. Because of your sin that you've birthed in your heart, carried out, you've caused another to go and to commit another sin. Now, we're not going to get on to the issue of, now, whose fault is that? To whose charge is that? Like, sin, sin. God not happy with it. It's all that matters. But should we not strive to, like, the... Just, 10 verses before where we started reading well, sorry 11 verses before we started reading let your light so shine before men that they see your good works to glorify your father which is in heaven we ought to be the light to the world salt to the world but yet here just a few verses later Jesus is saying some y'all even though you preach right, you judge against others for doing all these things we're not going to get on judgment that doesn't happen until chapter number 7 we're not going to cover that many verses today I promise you Right, but he says it doesn't matter on how you judge your works towards others or how you judge and hold these standards up to others. Right? Woman at the well. The Bible says that she had five husbands. Jesus, talking to her, said, you've had five, and the one that you're with isn't your husband. He pronounced what she had done already. I wonder... How many of those husbands, right, she's guilty of the sin. We're not trying to cover that up. She's guilty. But how many of those marriages had to happen because a man decided to divorce her? And she had no option but to get remarried. You say, well, but Jordan, does that change her situation? No, she's still a sinner. I'm just saying, when you don't give somebody an option, Right? When your actions cause somebody else to commit a sin, you don't think that God looks at that and says that you're not somewhat responsible? Yeah, they chose to do it. They may not have had an option but to do it. She could have stayed single, probably been a beggar, right, on the side of the road, but she decided she didn't want to beg. She decided that she desired a home. Maybe she wanted kids. Right, but... Eventually, she's had five. And the one that she had now wasn't her husband. I don't see her splitting the hairs with the Lord and saying, but yeah, Lord, five men divorced me. She didn't argue with them. She said, true. But then she also realized that, you know, hey, this guy ain't not a normal guy. Then she starts getting to the issue, which was her, the spiritual issues that Jesus was trying to talk to her about. What are you saying? Everybody's got a story on why they did or what they did. Doesn't matter. What matters is when you know better. That you say, well, I didn't do it, Brother Jordan. But if you purposed in your heart that if you thought you could get away with it, or if there was a way that you could do it and feel okay with yourself, according to the Word of God, you're guilty already. But then he goes on to say, if your actions cause somebody else to go out, leave them no option but to sin, 
or you start them on a path where because of what you did in reaction they sent you don't think that you you bear some guilt some consequence in that well I did I was just acting within my rights well there are rights and then there's God's law we're not bound under the law but God gives us the perfect law of liberty what's that? that we should live as his son as Christ show me one example where Christ ever said or did one thing that tempted somebody else to, to sin right? that caused an emotional reaction in somebody that he was guilty of them being angry no if they got angry it's because they didn't like what God said all Jesus did was preach the word he was the word made flesh he fulfilled all of the law what saying? just because you do right doesn't mean that people aren't always going to get angry at you. but there's a difference between people being angry at you and you making somebody angry you tempting somebody else by your actions so what are we saying brother Jordan there's a anybody watch those uh Oh, what are they? Like the law and order, the crime scene investigation. They use this word a lot, but it's not like a legal principle. Okay, they say, well, we need to prove intent. You don't need intent to convict somebody. All you need is proof that they did it. You don't need to know why they did it. All you need is that proof that, hey, Jordan was speeding, he guilty. Well, no, we need to prove that he wanted to speed. No, you don't. You don't need intent. Right? Well, why did this person want to go down and steal somebody's car? Doesn't matter. I got his fingerprints in the car and him on videotape stealing the car. I don't need to know why he wanted to do it. Okay, well, you say, well, I didn't mean to. Right? In our world, doesn't matter. You did. But, well, here we get the opposite. In God's world, in God's courts, intent is everything. Did Noah intend to get off of the ark and become drunk because he drank the wine that was fermenting on the shelf that he didn't know nothing about? No. But after that, Noah never drank fermented wine again. But God didn't hold it to know. Is it Why? Because he didn't know, one, and two, he didn't intend to. But here in our passage, Jesus says, in God's eyes, doesn't matter if you don't divorce your wife, doesn't matter if you stay in the relationship that you've always wanted to, but it says that if you desire someone in your heart that you would have them, you're guilty of the act of adultery already. It says it doesn't matter that you went and did it, all that matters is intent in God's eyes. Now, if you want to do it enough, or if you want to do it badly enough, you'll do it. But here, he says, verse number 28, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after hath committed adultery already. Where? In his heart. That's the intent. Bear with me. That's what we're teaching on this morning, Brother Andy. I remembered to give you a title this week. It's called Intent. Let's say... Okay, everybody know we got service tonight, six o'clock. It's not really service; it's worship, but that's what people call it. It's service. Okay, six o'clock tonight. Everybody know this. Okay, it's on sign down at the end of the road. It's in the bulletins that we hand out. Barring those that are providentially entered. By the way, providentially means God caused it to happen. Right? That's the only time that God excuses it is when God doesn't give you an option but to miss church. That's the only time that it's excused with God. But let's say you come back tonight. But the entire time you're thinking about all the stuff that you could be doing back home if you weren't sitting in the church pew. Are you guilty of not coming to church even though you're in church? If your heart's not here, according to God, doesn't matter that your butt was in the seat. All that matters is that your heart was in a far country. You intended to go somewhere else, but you, you either guilted yourself into coming or you decided that you didn't want to hear the preacher preach on it next Sunday, so you was going to come anyway. 
Guess what? Preacher don't decide what to preach. God decides what preacher preaches. And if you're guilty of not wanting to be here, why you be here, he's probably still going to preach on it. Now, let's take it one step further. We know that we're supposed to be involved in the evangelism of the gospel, getting it out. Let's say you come to visitation Monday nights. That day, they always meet here. But Randy probably got a text message group set up somehow, let you know, hey, got wet, bad weather, right? Or something happened, whatever. But you show up, but the entire time you're on visitation, you're thinking about all that you could be doing back home or about the overtime that you could be working or you're thinking about all the things that you wish you could be doing instead or how you're going to have to stay up later because in order to fit everything in that you had to get in, but you think that God's really going to give you credit or approve the way that you went out on visitation? You're supposed to be going on visitation excited to tell somebody else about what you've already received. You think if you've got that spirit and somebody does open the door when you put the track on the door, oh, hey, can you tell me more about your church? You think you're going to give them an honest answer? You think you're going to be excited to tell that person? No, you're probably going to look like Ebenezer Scrooge and scare them from ever coming. It's not what you do that is the final decision maker on whether or not God's, God's happy with your life. Right? Now certainly, God cares about what you do. But your actions always start where? In your heart. Just because you've compelled your flesh to do something today doesn't mean that you'll continue to do it tomorrow. God says, if your heart's in a far country, you're already there. Your body just hadn't caught up to you yet. Do you think if you sit in church thinking about all the other things you could be doing, how long do you think it's going to be before you're eventually just doing those things? It's not about where you're at here today. That's what I see. That's what you see. You can fool me. But in fact, probably pretty easy. Because one, when I'm at church, I'm not paying attention too much else what's going on. I'm here to see Jesus. Right? I'm thinking about either what I was about ready to teach or I'm sitting down over there begging God to show me where I could have done it better. Right? Then it's time to start singing. But well, then what am I thinking? I'm thinking about what we're singing about, Jesus. Then it's time to sit down, listen to more singing, right? listen to the choir, listen to great preaching. What am I doing? I'm trying to stay plugged in, so I don't care what's going on around me. That's between you and God. All I can do is affect what I've done. Well, then what? Well, then after church, I'm thinking about stuff going on back there. Right? Then as soon as I leave, I'm thinking about, all right, Lord, we're still teaching the same thing for teens class tonight that we worked on yesterday. You're going to change it up? You even want to have teens class. Maybe it's going to get big in here. Right? Beginning of the service Sunday night. We just stay in here. God show up. Well, you say, I'm... I do my best not to look around. It's real easy to fool me. Because I got my nose to the grindstone. At least I'm trying to. But just because you fool me doesn't matter. Just because you're sitting where you know you ought to be doesn't mean that you're sitting there in the right spirit. Now, let's take this one step further. What if your intent has an impact on somebody else? Now, Brother Mike, if I am speeding and I decide that I'm not slowing down, even though you have a much bigger vehicle than me and you could probably run me off the road very easily in that truck, right? but I decide, oh, no, I'm honking and I'm flashing brights at you and you're getting out of the way. But if I do that and that causes you to swerve, right? what in the world is this madman doing? And you pop a flat tire because you hit the curb or something. Is that your fault or is that my fault? Yeah, of course you would, but. Now, did I make him steer his steering wheel to get out of the way? No, he decided to do that. But my insurance would laugh at him if he tried to claim it against me. But where did it all initially start at? Who gave him the motivation to get out of the way? My intent. 
But in God's eyes, we're not talking about the letter of man's law. We're talking about God's law. But if I tried to shove him out the way, okay, that's what I was trying to do in my car. Hey, get out the way. Maybe I didn't do any damage to his truck, but his tire's gone. Hopefully he's got a spare. Right? Well, it, what not? Then he's stranded. He got called AAA. Did I make him swerve? No, I didn't make him swerve. But my intent had an impact on him. I was trying to get him out the way, and I wasn't going to be happy until he's out the way. Now, I'm sorry you're on the side of the road, but I got to keep going. He said, that's not right. Yeah, I know it's not right. But how many times in our daily life do we not care about what happened to other people? We're just worried about our intent. I just want to go to work, going to want to come home. But God gave you a job, one, so that you could provide for your needs. Right? God, through your business, is providing for all your needs. But God also gave you that job so that you could be a witness unto Him on the job. I mean, I can't remember how many weeks ago it was now, but our pastor did preach that we're to do all things as unto Christ. That's still in the book. You know, that means work your job like you was working the job for Jesus. Because you are. Talk to people on the job like you were talking to the Lord. Walk around your job like Jesus was your boss on the job. Doesn't matter if boss man's looking, you do the job like Jesus asked you to do it. You telling me if we don't have that attitude that we're not going to impact people differently? What if my intent gives somebody we know that this is the truth because of where we're at today. You ever tried to well where do you go to church? Bainer Baptist Church. Oh Baptist. Right? We've all heard that. You know why we all heard that? Because somebody's intent made a bad impact on that on that person's life. Well, what'd they do? Doesn't matter. Gave them a bad taste in their mouth. That's not the way that it should be. Is it my fault that that person's had bad things happen to them? No. But it makes it a whole lot harder to witness to that person because of it. You're telling me that's the will of God? No. It's not God's will that any stumbling blocks come between a person and Christ. It's His will that none should perish, all should come to repentance. But when we become a stumbling block rather than a stepping stone, our intent is having an impact on somebody else's life. Doesn't matter that I didn't intend to be a, you know, a barrier to that person in Christ. All that matters is, is that I eventually did become one. Sometimes inaction is the worst thing you could have done. But if your intent is to just fly under the radar, nobody notices you, you want to get in, you want to get out, you just want to punch your time clock, that's not what God wanted you to do. You're supposed to be a witness, a light, like we already said. You're supposed to be salt. Now salt preserves, salt disinfects. It's not very, you know, pleasant experience to have a wound cleaned with salt. But it'll get the job done. But in all those things, you know what you have to do? You got to rub the salt into whatever you want to have an impact on. That doesn't happen just by flying in under the radar. We're supposed to be salt to the world. You know when salt's useless? When it's lost its savor, then what's it say? It's throw it out in the street and men trot it under their feet. It's not enough to just be salt. You got to be applied as the salt. Your intent should be that, Lord, let a little bit of what's in me rub off on them, right, for their sake, not for our sake. Why? To preserve them to the point that somebody else can come and share a little bit of the gospel with them. Right, Lord, just give me enough. Some plant, some water, God gives the increase. Lord, whether you want me to be the seed or you want me to be the water, I want my intent to be that I have a positive impact on this person's life. May not be much, but it may just be the drop of water that keeps them thirsty enough. Right? Still looking around for what God would have them to do rather than turn into the world to go out and satisfy that thirst. Just go for the easy answer. Well, you say, my intent kept that person interested long enough. Allowed God to keep working on them. Maybe they come to the church. That's not up to me. That's up to God. 
But in order to apply salt to something, it takes a little bit of effort. You don't just sprinkle salt on ham and then throw it in the ground and expect it to last a while. That's what they had root cellars back in the day in the ground. Right? There was a way to do it, but just, oh, here's a little bit of salt, throw it in. The... No, that's not going to make the ham be preserved. There was a process. Right? If you get a cut, don't just take table salt and throw it in there. That's not going to be good. Probably better to dissolve it in water, like Epsom salt, something like that. Okay, but also don't do that. There's this stuff called uh, neosporin. Okay, use that instead. That will disinfect. But back then, push came to shove, just sprinkle it. No, you had to work the salt into the wound to disinfect it, not just surface all of it. Took a little bit of effort, took a little bit of pain. But he's saying you had to have intent in order to be salt in somebody's life. But if you don't have that intent, guess what? You're hiding your candle under a bushel. You're taking your salt and you're saving it on the shelf, not realizing it's already lost its savor. What is the savor of your salt? It's that, one, God wants to do something with you. But we know that if God's will wasn't for you to be used of them, he'd already taken you out of here. So that savor is never going to be lost. But the second savor is that you want to take what God gave you and give it to somebody else. We know that his words forever settled in heaven. We know that Jesus right, said all should come to repentance. Right, whosoever. So what's that mean? The gospel's never going to lose its savor, but you may lose yours. What's that? Your intent. His invitation's still the same. His will is that you go and that none perish. So what's the only thing in the equation that can change? My desire to go. Some still being used to salt because they want to be. Those that aren't, right? They, they can't be used. Because we know God. God can use anything to do anything. But what do we have to do in order to be used of God? Yield ourselves. You know what that yielding is saying? Lord, I don't want my intents any longer. I want your intents. Lord, I understand that if I have a bad day and I intend to hide myself away from the world, I may do damage in somebody else's life. Does it make you guilty of adultery or anything? No, but it makes you guilty of not being what God wants you to be. And whether you meant to do it or not is relevant. Right? Well, God, I didn't know that that was going to happen. No, but you did know that you didn't want to be around people that day. But God wants you to be around people. Lord, I didn't mean to commit adultery. It doesn't matter. You desired to have her in your heart. He's guilty of it already. We don't get to choose the consequences of our actions. We just get to choose our actions. We get to have control over the thoughts and intents of our hearts. What we forget so often is just because I don't reach out and touch something doesn't mean that I haven't had an impact on it. Right? Just because I don't see what happened on the other side doesn't mean that it wasn't my fault. I'm trying to think of that movie right now. There was a scene where the guy just stepped on one thing and then you see everything unravel and then the whole town come falling down. Well, I didn't mean to do that. doesn't matter. You did it. Did I design it? Was I the one that put it all together where one string will cause the whole thing to come unraveled? No. But I wanted to do it, and that's the end result. doesn't matter how small a thread you think you're pulling on. If the thing unravels, it's still your fault. Just because you don't do it doesn't mean that you're not guilty of it. But just when you do nothing, when you should have done something, also doesn't excuse you from the guilt. It's not about what we see as a result of our actions, not what we feel about what we've done. What matters? This is what in everything I've been trying to get to. Anything other than if this is God's perfect will for your life. Anything other than our intent being perfectly in line with what God desires for us 
not the will of God. Well, if it's not the will of God, what's that mean? Well, God's holy, which means His will is holy. Which means at the best, it's iniquity, unequal dealing with God. But if you regard iniquity in your heart, God's not even going to hear your prayers. At worst, it's sin. But both of them are what? Contrary to what God wants in your life. It means you're guilty of it. Doesn't matter that you came and you brought yourself in and sat yourself down. Doesn't mean that you've earned any cookie points with God. God don't keep attendance, by the way. You know what God keeps track of? God looks at your heart when you walk in the door. He's not looking to see if you was here. He was looking to see if you came with the right spirit. He was looking at your intent. He was looking when he was getting ready this morning and he was wishing, man, I just don't feel good. I don't want to go, but I'm going to go anyway. Knowing that the entire time you're here, you're going to be miserable thinking about how much better it would be back at home. You ain't going to get anything out of church today. You know, those that will, those that felt awful but said, God's been too good for me not to go down and worship him. And when they came in, their intent was, doesn't matter how bad I feel, he deserves to be praised today. That person's going to walk out having done business with God today. What made the difference? The intent. That, that both could have felt the exact same amount of awful. They both could have felt like, but today, I'm not having my best day, but he's always the same. He's just as good today as he was yesterday. They may feel awful. Right? Jesus is able to do just as much for both of them. But what makes the difference? One can't get over their own intent, which is, I feel so bad that all I can think about is me. The other one has the intent that regardless of how I feel, God is great and greatly to be praised. It's all down to intent. Man can win the whole world and lose his own soul. You can do everything right, but do it for the wrong reason. And if that's the case, do you really think you'll receive a reward in heaven? No, oh, because your actions probably did more harm than good. God maybe winked at your ignorance and did something in the midst of it, but it was in spite of you, not because of you. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.